discussing a minor, trivial, inconsequential topic, the meaning of life. It's a subject that threatens to descend into philosophical caricature, the sort that might have been satirised in Monty Python or Douglas Adams. But Professor John Cottingham of Reading University thinks that the meaning of life is worthy of serious philosophical consideration. John Cottingham, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Today I'd like to ask you about a topic that is quite serious for most of us, the meaning of life. What do you think the meaning of life is? <laughs> well, I can't give you a quick one-sentence answer on that, but the topic's been very exciting to me because it was a topic which, when I was an undergraduate, was one of those that we were all told philosophy doesn't deal with. And one of the exciting things about the subject is it's become a much broader and richer subject since I was a student. And the traditional grand questions of philosophy are now on the agenda again. There's been a whole rash of material on questions like the meaning of life. The answer to the question is a complicated one. The main problem about human existence is its fragility. The projects which we embark on are constantly in danger of foundering because of ordinary contingencies of life. You don't mean because of death, for instance. I mean, well, that's the obvious uh, fragility uh, underlying everything, that we're always going to die at some point. Exactly. That's the most striking one. But illness, old age, infirmity. Philosophers have often written as if human beings are autonomous, grand, self-sufficient agents who are somehow in charge of their lives. And then philosophy's job is supposed to be to map out the conditions for the good life. Well, there's nothing wrong with trying to map out the conditions for the good life. But there's more to it than that because we are dependent on these contingencies. And so a meaningful life has to be one which is not just rich in various ways, including enriching and valuable activities, but which somehow comes to terms with this fragility and this contingency. So you're saying that as human beings we encounter things, obstacles to our projects. I might want to be an athlete and I break my leg when I'm 21 and it just is not possible. So any mapped out plan for life that doesn't allow for contingency isn't going to work. That's exactly right, yes. And the other feature of a meaningful life seems to me to be rather hard to specify, but it's to do with the moral dimension. I don't think we count a life as meaningful if it's entirely occupied with selfish or vicious activities. So we require our lives to have a certain sort of moral resonance in order to count as genuinely meaningful. So both those things I've mentioned, the contingency bit and the kind of moral resonance bit, I think point us away from simplistic answers, for example, utilitarian answers, which, as you know, claim that everything boils down to pleasure or satisfaction, point us away from that and in the direction of something, to put it loosely, something more spiritual. So questions about the meaning of life, I think, are, are connected with grand traditional questions about the place of spirituality in, in human existence. Could you give me an example of the way contingencies affect our projects? I will, and, and ways in which they affect even our moral projects. If we consider the case of a devoted moralist who spends all his life helping others, he decides to build a hospital for lepers, let's say. He devotes vast time and resources raising money for this project. He works at it. He recruits people to help. But on the day the hospital is due to open, it's struck by a meteorite. So his project is in ashes. Can we say he has had a meaningful life? Well, if we just define meaningfulness in terms of engaging with worthwhile moral goals, then perhaps we can. But I think most people would say that there's a certain sort of futility about that endeavor. Now, you could say with Camus in his famous The Myth of Sisyphus, one of the great icons of 20th century absurdist philosophy. That's just the way it is. We roll the rock up the hill. You know, Sisyphus was sentenced to the endless task of rolling the boulder up the hill. As soon as he's got it to the top, it crashes down to the bottom again. He turns around, walks back down the hill, and starts again. Camus says in the last sentence of that myth, we must imagine Sisyphus as being happy. Well, there's a, perhaps an irony in that, or perhaps not, but it's certainly an absurdist vision. He's saying, really, 
human life never really succeeds. The rock's always going to roll downhill. We've somehow got to be defiant in the face of that absurdity. I think you could live that way. You could just say, well, let's try and live as morally as possible. When we fail, when contingencies strike, we just walk down the hill, start again. But that would presuppose a very heroic temperament, I think. I don't believe that you or I, perhaps you could, but certainly not I, uh, and most human beings could live in that heroic way in the face of contingency and absurdity. And it's that, the need for hope, that despite all our weakness and despite the uh, contingencies and fragilities, the good somehow is still worth pursuing, will still in, in some way have a hope of triumphing. It's that which leads us towards the idea of spirituality. So are you then saying that in the absence of hope that humanity will save itself, we have to look outward to God or some other life? Well, perhaps I'm saying that, but I think we should beware of simplistic interpretations of religion, which just say, uh, well, we can't do it ourselves, so it's all going to be OK in the next world. I'm certainly not advocating that kind of pie-in-the-sky approach Rather, it's this, that optimism is hard to warrant, hard to justify. We need something like the religious virtue of hope. And hope and optimism are different, I think. Hope is something which is a characteristically religious virtue. It's one of the three traditional theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. And its cultivation is to do with systematic patterns of spiritual discipline. This is the great Western tradition of spirituality. The reason for moving in that direction is that we need more than just an unreasoned or jaunty optimism. We need to cultivate in ourselves the moral and spiritual basis for being able to live in the face of absurdity and contingency and failure. And that's where the disciplines of spirituality come in. So spirituality is not just a matter of having metaphysical beliefs that it's all going to be OK in the next world. It's a matter of the interior cultivation of certain kinds of, of virtue. And are those virtues reliant on the metaphysical element? Do you have to believe in God to engage in those sort of spiritual exercises which could give you the emotional power to carry on in the face of absurdity? Well... In my more recent book, The Spiritual Dimension, I address that question, the, the relationship between praxis, spiritual praxis, and belief. Praxis being? Praxis being engagement in disciplines and traditions of action and practice, for example, meditation, which are aimed at the cultivating of, of these virtues we've been talking about, such as hope. Now, many people think that belief comes first, that in order to embark on a program of spiritual praxis, for example, you've got to first get all your beliefs sorted out. But Blaise Pascal, the great French philosopher in the 17th century, had a different view. He thought that you should embark on the praxis or the practice first, and the faith would come later. And that seems to me the right way round. You can't secure your beliefs in advance because the sort of things we're talking about, faith and hope and so on, come as a result of immersion in traditions of spiritual praxis. They come, as it were, after you've embarked on the path, further down the line, rather than being secured in advance. So if you were speaking to somebody listening to this and telling them you're looking for meaning in your life, what would be the first steps they could take to achieve that? Well, I, I'm not sure I would presume to advise people in general. There are no doubt many paths. I think people do have to reflect on these issues of contingency. They do if they are reasonably interested in ideas. I mean, I'm not saying that only people who are interested in, in the intellect and in ideas can have a decent or worthwhile or meaningful life. But for those who are, and that includes a very large number of us in modern, educated Western society, and I think we do have to reflect seriously on how human life is limited, how most of our endeavours are likely to be frustrated in the long run, 
and on the fact that we're not self-sufficient, autonomous creatures. In a phrase Alistair McIntyre has used recently, we are dependent rational animals. He's taking there the famous definition of Aristotle, man is a rational animal, but adding that crucial fact, dependent. Dependent on what? Well, we didn't create ourselves. We are dependent on a whole host of conditions that have brought us into existence, whether you believe those are just natural chains of events or whether you believe we are created, as traditional religious views have it, from some divine source. But whichever way you look at it, we are dependent on the causes that brought us into existence. We're also dependent on others, certainly as children and later as we get older, and we have to live our lives against that backdrop. So part of what I'm doing in the, in the Meaning of Life book is to try and push against what I think are very arrogant conceptions of humanity, like Nietzsche's, for example. You know, Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, thought we could create somehow create our own values by grand acts of will. It seems to me we can't create our own values. We are born into circumstances which we didn't create. We have to find value within a given cosmos, not one of our making. And so the first step towards meaningfulness is, is humility, if you like, acknowledging the fact of that dependency. I'd like to come back to the practical question, though, because you're advocating more than an, a purely intellectual engagement with ideas, but saying philosophy should engage with how you live your life at the level of spiritual exercise. So I'm trying to understand what a spiritual exercise actually looks like. Hmm. Right. Let me give an analogy, and that's psychoanalytic praxis. Now, a lot of analytic philosophers are very skeptical about Freud and psychoanalysis. And I certainly wouldn't want to defend all the details of Freud's elaborate theories. But one thing Freudian in the broadest sense thought acknowledges is that we are dependent. We don't create our own minds, our own selves, but we are shaped and formed by things that happened to us long before we became rational, fully rational. And that we need to understand this and come to terms with it. And that the way to do so is through, essentially, through a course of praxis, guided self-discovery. That I take it to be the psychoanalytic program. You see someone regularly, you reflect on with guidance on your past, and you try to understand yourself better. Spiritual praxis is actually somewhat similar. Augustine, St. Augustine, way back at the close of the Roman Empire, talked about each person having to descend into the inner self where truth dwells. So religious meditation and the practices involved in that, the programs of self-discovery, are not all that unlike what goes on in, in psychoanalytic praxis. There's a sort of triangle, philosophy, psychoanalysis, religion. That traditionally has been thought of as a triangle of hostility. You know, most philosophers are very anti-psychoanalysis. Most religious people are often anti-psychoanalysis. And indeed, psychoanalytic thinkers, many of them, are against religion. I mean, Freud was notoriously critical of religion. But actually, I think there's a triangle of harmony there. All three, properly understood, are engaged on this deeper traditional question of self-understanding, of linking our theoretical beliefs with understanding who we are and how we should live if we're to live meaningful lives. John Cossingham, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And you can hear more philosophy.